I'm Tree, this is my project, and this is the wall beside my desk. And they never tell you about these things when you go to art school, or at least they didn't when I went to art school. So earlier this week, I went to a meeting with the Wisconsin Arts Board about their strategic plan for the 2015 to 2017 fiscal year, which the 2015 fiscal year starts in July. So that's why they're talking to us now. And during that meeting, they asked us for our input to get back to them in, like, the next week or two. And I've done my reading, and I have some thoughts. Really. Just a few thoughts. Just one or two. I don't have anything to say at all. Now, the Wisconsin Arts Board is tr emphasizing that arts are not a frill, that arts education is vitally important that and that the arts have cultural and economic value which is good we approve of this however that being said I think that there's a fundamental misunderstanding in their strategic plan about the value of the arts that the real value of the arts all arts comes from its inherent and fundamental nature of being critical thinking problem solving, research, and communication all in one place. So you know that stuff that we all use pretty much all the time no matter what our career path is. I'm also having problems with some of the vagaries of the language that they're using, like the word creativity. Because coming out of arts education, which I did, um, creativity is one of these words that we have working definitions for, but no singular definition. It becomes vitally important that when we talk about creativity, we have to triangulate which definitions we're using to create the definition that we're talking about in conversation. Also, when we talk about creativity, it's with the awareness that creativity is a culturally constructed notion that depending on where, what culture you're coming out of, the overarching culture, the cultures within culture, and the microcultures and the participatory cultures within which you exist dictate what creativity means for you as a creator. If you don't believe me, read Creativity in Schools by Anna Craft. Yes, Anna Craft. Um, it's not big. It's really important. And if after reading that you don't have an understanding that creativity is a cultural construct and culturally dictated, then read Creativity by Chicksamahai, and you'll see that there there is an even greater uh, disparity between notions of individual creativity, collective creativity, and what it means sociologically and psychologically and from a business standpoint to be seen as creative. They also spend a lot of time talking about traditional art. Seriously, what does that even mean? Which is fine, but what happens when you don't fall into that definition of traditional art, whatever that definition is? I mean, seriously, what if you're a performance artist or a video artist? Or what if you do all of your art through a digital medium? Is that not art enough for them? And really, it's not just about Web 2.0 or, as I started calling it, Art 2.0. Vernacular art is much more inclusive and much less classist and less potentially racist. And Wisconsin has some of the most amazing vernacular art. And most of it's curated through the Kohler uh, down in Sheboygan. Yes, Sheboygan. That's where it is. And yes, like the faucets, but they have a museum and they curate all these huge land installations that are huge art pieces and they're amazing seriously go google vernacular art wisconsin and you will end up with the neatest stuff there's a steampunk one seriously tell me that isn't amazing but i want to know what happens when you fall outside of these very almost modernist definitions of art because art is like everything else it progresses Right now we're in postmodernism, or likely, if you're my age or younger, post-postmodernism, which my friend Susie call, refers to it as conscientious, uh, conscientious postmodernism. That was hard to say. 
Conscientious postmodernism. Conscientious postmodernism. Conscientious postmodernism. Oh my God, is that hard to say? Um, and I refer to it as quixotic postmodernism. And really, we're using different terms for the exact same thing for the exact same reasons. And really, the difference between postmodernism and post-postmodernism is that postmodernism was all about deconstruction, and there was this, you know, extreme existential angst because of World War II and all the lives that were lost. Again, see the abstract expressionists and the entire... How do we make paintings? How do we create in a world that's filled with chaos and destruction and death and horribleness? I may actually need a haircut. Whereas post-postmodernism, whether you're going to call it conscientious or quixotic or something else that I haven't heard yet, is really about de the deconstruction of postmodernism, but reconstructing it with something into something new and something that's aware and critical and often works to be ad activism in a really substantial generative way. Oh my god, I swear the strategic plan reads like it was written by a bunch of middle-class white people for middle-class white people, and it's really, really frustrating. And they seem to have taken Elliot Eisner way too far to heart with his entire idea of appreciation. So, yeah, if you're not a modernist, it feels like, as not a modernist, we're falling outside the purview of the strategic plan. There's also issues with the inherent rhetorical issue of lifelong learners, because whenever you ask anybody, what do you think a lifelong learner is? They're going to say, well, it's people who are outside of college, right? We're talking about adults and old people and yeah, we're, we're talking about them, right? And in reality, being a lifelong learner is something that encompasses any age. And if kids aren't encouraged to think and discover and make, they're not going to become lifelong learners. So lifelong learner, by that idea of wanting people to be creative individuals their entire lives, needs to start at the beginning. And if you spent five minutes on Tumblr, you know that lifelong learners come in all shapes and sizes and cultures. Basically, we're talking about that research thing again. There also seems to be this underlying assumption that creative producers don't exist in Wisconsin. Which they do. Or at least they don't exist outside of Milwaukee, Madison, and Door County. Which, again, they do. The thing is, is that we're everywhere. We're just not necessarily apparent in our communities because our communities don't support us. Seriously, I say conceptual art, I say mixed me media art, and I get blank stares. But we're also talking about the better part of three generations of creative makers having moved almost exclusively to the virtual world because it's the only world we can afford to live in. That's a really incredibly sad thought when you think about it. So, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts and I have a lot of stuff to write up to send to the nice people um, that I have to make sound actually coherent and not all uh, squid of anger. So, yeah, I guess I should go do that. Courage.